was during my studies I came to realize that I'm living at a time of important change and I started to feel responsibility to make sure this change comes out well. I felt I wanted to do my best to preserve our beautiful and vital cities and landscapes for the yet to be born. So I began to work hard in research and consulting and initiatives to contribute to building a climate-friendly society. In 2013, I was appointed to my current position as a professor of sustainable economics at the University of Applied Science Constance. In the photo, you can see me with my certificate of appointment. I was more than happy about this new challenge. From now on, it would be my job to provide my students with the exact knowledge, skills and capabilities they would need to build a climate-friendly future. Highly motivated, I started to prepare my courses. Reflecting what should be the key content of my teaching, I came up with five questions or topics which I thought would prepare and motivate my students to take action. Those five questions were, first, where are we? This describes reality as it is. We are dangerously heating our home planet by burning the fossil fuels, oil, gas and coal. Floods, droughts, crop failures, wildfires. We can already observe the consequences of the heating and they could change our countryside forever. The climate crisis is a massive threat to peaceful coexistence in all our societies. Even the survival of mankind itself may be at risk how it hurts to face this reality. And this led to my second question. How could we end up like this? And here's my answer. Here in Germany, like in many other countries, we are enjoying a living standard unique in human history. We owe this to the generation of our parents and grandparents. How bitter it is to realize today that many of the technologies, manufacturing processes and daily habits we adopted are massively harming the climate. And how disillusioning to see how our laws and regulations are not preventing this. The reason for this is simple. Those technologies, manufacturing processes, habits and regulations were made at a time when oil, gas and coal promised to be a good choice as cheap and infinite sources of energy. Now that we know that these energies are causing the climate crisis, in the tradition of previous generations, we can use our creative power and decide to adapt to the new realities. The future now lies in our hands. And here followed my third question. What future would it be that we want to create? Where do we want to go? Of course, this is about ending our dependence on dirty fossil fuels and transferring to the clean energy from sun, wind and water. We know that these renewable sources of energy not only offer a reliable and secure energy supply, but also full national prosperity and secure long-term jobs. Then, producing less or no harm to the nature is not enough. We owe it to our children and grandchildren to even restore nature. So it's also about healing and repairing environments to return them to their natural state. The fourth question would then be, how will we get there? How can we possibly achieve this prospering future? There's a huge potential in people taking responsibility for where we are heading be it for our personal ways of life, our companies, our cities and our countries. We need a strong and decisive plan of action, like US President Kennedy's plan in the 1960s to travel to the moon within less than 10 years, which then became a national objective and was successfully achieved even before time. Today's plans need to be equally strong. They will provide for a new sense of focus so that we can all pull together and everybody contribute what we are good at. My fifth and last question was, who are we or what are we here to do? Here, I would remind my students that we are part of a story that started long before we can remember and continues long beyond anyone will remember us. Well, personally, this reminds me to appreciate and enjoy life and its pleasures more deeply, but then it also makes clear that it is our duty to safeguard our world and conserve the unique privilege of life on our planet. 
I kind of dumped my students with information on these five questions and I kind of expected them to come out of my course as little change agents longing to take action. And yes, students had gained knowledge around the climate crisis and the how-to of climate protection that I'd been able to check in the exam. But no, there was no visible action being triggered by this knowledge. Instead of the dynamics I'd hoped to create, I perceived a sense of despair and helplessness in the face of today's reality and the challenges lying ahead. I was devastated. There I was, having the job I dreamt of, and what was I making of it? I had completely failed in empowering these young people to perceive themselves as potent individuals who can make a difference. I was even doubting whether at all I could make a difference in this world. Being a scientist, I decided to see whether there was any research that could help me understand what had happened. It didn't take me long to find out that the thing I had experienced is a common phenomenon. There's even a term for it. Scientists call it the attitude behavior gap. We know what would be the right thing to do, but we still don't do it. And thinking this through, you probably all have an example for this in your mind. So now the problem had a name and I could understand it, which left me with the next question. How can this attitude behavior gap be overcome? We thought it might be a good idea to add concrete student action to the pure teaching of information. To base this action on facts, we would first analyze the climate impact of our everyday lives. Therefore, each student would calculate his or her personal carbon footprint. In a second step, students would then choose one specific lifestyle change experiment that would really make a difference in terms of reduced climate gases. The experiment was to be run for four weeks and we called it a climate challenge. We found students highly motivated and here's a taste of what they engaged in. Four weeks on a vegetarian or purely plant-based diet or a car-free month or consumption relief, four weeks without buying new items and sorting out boxes of things that are no longer loved and needed to pass them on. Four weeks proved to be a good duration for the experiment. It was short enough to make it seem possible and it was long enough for students to start weaving new routines into their lives. We also evaluated this scientifically. Almost all students met their objectives successfully and most of them were happy and proud about their achievements. From psychology, I learned how precious this experience is. Knowing that one's action has led to positive outcomes is one of the key predictors for taking action in the future. They call this concept self-efficacy. We were happy that the test run had turned out so well. On second thought, we noticed that with the definition of the task, we had directed the focus very much towards private action and changing one's own behavior. And thereby we had missed an important point. From my previous work, I knew that historical transitions like the one we are in have usually been driven by changes on two levels. Firstly, individuals deciding and acting differently. And secondly, a change in societal structures and frameworks that so strongly influence our individual decisions. I will explain this briefly. Changing behavior is what we had tried out successfully with our students. A person decides to change their lifestyle in order to become more climate friendly. From our climate challenge, I can say that this can feel really cool and I frequently observe how it inspires others around you. Besides our individual behavior, there are the societal structures in which we live. This includes laws, the range of products offered to us by companies or the prevailing social practices. These structures matter because we normally stick to the law. We can only buy products that are on offer and affordable. And we usually feel better if our peer group approves of our decisions. These structures somehow guide our behavior. And unfortunately, up to now in terms of climate protection, they often steer us in the wrong direction. 
Probably you have also made such experiences. For example, that it is often cheaper to take a plane than to travel a certain distance by train. Or you won't find a climate-friendly opportunity, like in my university's cafeteria, where they don't offer a plant-based dish each day. I guess you could continue this list. Seems like due to those unsupportive societal structures and framework conditions, it is not always easy to do the right thing. The good news here is that today's framework conditions are not God-given, they are human-made, which makes them subject to human-driven change. They date back to a time when the climate crisis was not an issue. So it is only logical that now that we face the transition to a climate-friendly society as an ambitious challenge, we refine those framework conditions. That includes politics to make sure that the price for flying reflects the real climate damage costs caused by flying. Or my cafeteria proudly advertising that its cheapest choice is always a delicious plant-based dish. I would be really happy about that. I guess you have an idea about these two levels of change now. And having reflected on how both of them matter, it became clear to us we had to further develop our climate change. It should include starting points for individual action addressing both levels. And here is what we came up with. As before, the climate challenge would begin with a four-week lifestyle experiment to reduce one personal carbon footprint. We call this a footprint challenge. As a new step, we would then ask students why most of society had not already jumped in and joined in their footprint challenge behavior. This question motivated students to reflect on structural barriers experienced during their footprint challenge. Following that, we asked them to develop and implement an activity addressing this barrier. This activity we call their handprint challenge. The results of running our first combined footprint and handprint challenge were amazing. So we continued with the concept and have since been able to accompany hundreds of young people through their climate challenges. As a rule, we find that taking action on one's own carbon footprint is virtually self-driven once triggered. In contrast, the handprint challenge seems to be relatively unfamiliar. However, once students get into this handprint pattern of thinking, exciting results develop. Frequently, students serve their family or their friends delicious climate-friendly meals, or they organize a close exchange party among fellow students where clothes that are not worn anymore find new owners. Restaurant chefs are encouraged to give away their leftover foods for a small price instead of throwing it away, or the manager of a supermarket has shown how he could simplify shopping for vegans by including a vegan label on the price tag. Or a student talks to the mayor of her home village and makes concrete suggestions how to improve the cycling network. On the whole, our challengers also like to share their experiences via social media. Well, it seems to work and just recently students told me that after the course they now feel well prepared for their role as powerful change agents for a safe and vital future. Before I close, I want to tell you how working with the climate challenge has changed my personal life for the better. And I'm very grateful to my students for that. Before we started the climate challenge for a long time, I had directed my activities almost completely to the handprint level. I thought if many people like me, we hold together, we would finally succeed in triggering the necessary changes of our structural framework. I believe behavior changes are not important to look at because ultimately they would come automatically because it's just the new normal. But when I once again read a student's report of switching to a plant-based diet, I suddenly felt I should try this out by myself. The result is that I'm now a pragmatic and pleasure-first vegan, which means delicious continues to be my first priority when eating, and when there's no vegan food living up to this, I deliberately turn a blind eye. Taking such a pragmatic approach turned out to be very helpful for my evolving footprint activities. I accept 
I cannot do things perfectly right. And I make myself aware that it is not my individual shortcoming, but that the structures are just not so supportive yet. Which is the reason why I continue to devote energy and time to my handprint activities. And maybe my persuasiveness there has increased as people see that I try to walk the talk. And this last point links to what I think is most important about the changes in my personal lifestyle. They do not only serve the climate, but somehow they also make me stronger. Could it be narrowing down my attitude behavior gap releases energy? My own behavior and action have become more integrated with my worldview and somehow this proves to be a continuous source of power in my life. So what could all of this mean for you? What if you let the facts about the climate crisis read your mind and at the same time you do something relevant about it? What would be a key climate affecting behavior among your habits and how could you change this for the better for a trial period of let's say four weeks and how will it feel having succeeded? And beyond this private activity, what could be your handprint starting point? How could you, maybe together with others, make a contribution, however small, to improving our society's structures so that climate protection becomes easier for all of us? I had the privilege to witness it frequently. And I have experienced it in my own personal life. There is an enormous power in letting the reality of the climate crisis touch you and stay brave and take responsibility. The future lies in our hands. Mm -hmm.